All right, just to start off very quickly, please stop making weird noises because nobody wants to hear that. Just to start off super early, we started off with the terrestrial biomes. That are the land biomes. We have not made it to the aquatic biomes yet. We will. Um, test is most likely Thursday unless we get to it and I realize, yeah, we're ready by Wednesday. My gut, Colton, tells me the test is going to be Thursday. So we'll see how that goes. I do have some people that are going to be gone that will not be here on Thursday. If you know that, your best bet is to go ahead and take the test on Wednesday. You need to let us know that instead of just not showing up on Thursday, um, that would not be okay. But again, all the land biomes. We started off in the grasslands. What are some things that you remember about the grasslands? Ava. Flat with lots of grass, realer. So that's in the that's going to be in the in the um, prairies. That's the prairie dogs or groundhogs. There's the groundhogs that do the same thing. We know that grass is the most important plant life. We have two grasslands: prairies, which are in North America, savannas, which are in Africa. We'll talk about both of those. In America, in the prairie, they have two different distinct seasons. Pretty hot summers, pretty cold winters, and the winters can be very, very harsh in the grasslands there. 20 to 35 inches of rain, not enough for deciduous trees. The deciduous trees need a little bit more rain than that for them to grow and thrive. Grasses are the main plant life. Are there some trees? Sure, of course there are. Are there some bushes and shrubs? Absolutely. Um, lots of grass, and with lots of grass came lots of herbivores, and that's going to bring your predators and your carnivores in as well. We learned a little bit about these prairie dogs. We saw the bison that were eating in the same place. We learned that the prairie dogs doing their job, filling their niche, is how the bison and antelope and birds and gophers are able to survive because it keeps the grass low enough for them to see survivors, and it causes new grass to grow, new grass to grow with more proteins in it, which is nice for those bigger animals, so they have it for the winter time. Now, not only did we learn about that. We talked a little bit about the savanna. Still a grassland, very different. This does have a few more trees, as you can see those acacia trees, but those acacia trees have learned how to do that. We are not drawing on ourselves. We're going to set away. Thanks, sir. All right. Elephants, rhinoceroses, lions, antelopes, zebras live in the savanna. Um, we know that their climate is a lot warmer year round although they do have a quote-unquote winter when it gets all the way down to a freezing 68 degrees. That is not cold. Um, again, they call it their winter, uh, but it's a very dry winter. They get most of their uh, rain in those six to eight months of summer. Still, when it dries out, they have those wildfires that run through. We have the acacia tree, which has learned to store water in a very cactus-like way. We know that the acacia tree has other adaptations. It can change the flavor of its leaves when giraffes are eating too many, and somehow they communicate to other acacias. We talked about <clears throat> the lions and the zebras and the giraffes and other animals that you might find in the savanna. And then we moved on to the tundra. What do you remember about the tundra? <clears throat> Evan. It is the second driest biome behind the desert. <clears throat> it is the coldest of all the biomes. And because it's cold and doesn't have a lot of water, it's hard for plants to live there. They don't have a lot of grass. They don't have a lot of bushes. They have no trees. They have like these small, very like low-growing plants. We have animals like polar bears and penguins and things that live there as well. If you're going to live there, you have to be adapted to it being dry and extremely, extremely cold. Yes, ma'am. We do have an Arctic bumblebee that's going to live a little bit in the lower parts of the Arctic so that it can be there in that time. They're not going to live right here where it's frozen all the time because there's no plants for them. But they're living a little lower, closer to the taiga, but it's still in the Arctic with the Arctic bumblebee. It's so cold there that some of the ground stays frozen permanently. That's called the permafrost. That's about six to eight inches under the ground there. Um, not a lot of rain, less than 10 inches in a year. That's more than a desert gets, though. We talked about the adaptations that animals and plants might have. We did look at that Arctic bumblebee. That moves us today into a place called the taiga. The taiga has many different names. 
They might call it a coniferous forest. Remembering from the vocabulary game that we played today, what does coniferous mean? What does coniferous mean? Anybody? Going once, going twice. That would be, they do have a short, a shorter summer, but coniferous trees are your conifers, your cone-bearing trees, your pine trees, your spruce trees. Um, it can also be called the boreal forest. I really hope they don't start throwing boreal in there because we have enough words as it is to remember, uh, but we'll talk about that if we start to see it later on. Um, long, cold winters, short, mild, and wet summers in a taiga. Um, in that dry time when there is no snow, wildfires are still not uncommon. And we know that the wildfires are important. It burns out the old trees. It burns out the undergrowth and all of the bushes and weeds and stuff. And it allows newer trees to grow and thrive. Plus, pine trees aren't necessarily dead if they get burned a little bit. They can still regrow. Uh, in a lot of the ways, like grass is able to regrow as long as the destruction isn't really bad with a pine tree. Compared to the other biomes, the taiga doesn't have a lot of diversity. I think one of our next biomes after this has half of the world's animals and plants stored in it, and that's pretty wild. The most common tree in the taiga is the conifer, a cone-bearing tree. You'll see in the video that we watched today that it's also called an evergreen because it is almost forever green until the thing dies and goes away. It's green all the time. Um, one special thing about those pine trees, Lily, is that they have very, very dark green needles. They don't have leaves. They have those little needles that are on like a Christmas tree would have. And those needles are great because they're thin and they don't release a lot of water. When we put those leaves from that branch and that water bottle in my room, we saw that the transpiration occurred and water would come out of the leaves. If you live in a place that doesn't get a lot of rain, you need to be very cactus-like in saving your water, and that is what our coniferous trees have adapted to do. That dark color, if we go outside in dark colors versus light colors, we know that the people in this room right now with the darker colors on would feel the heat a lot more than the people with light colors on because dark colors absorb heat and that dark green of those pine trees is absorbing more of the sunlight so that it can actually go through more photosynthesis. Yet another adaptation of the pine tree. We'll come back and watch that video at the end. Can't watch it and be copyright. The cold makes it a very difficult place to live. A lot of these animals are gonna migrate. They're gonna leave and come back when it's warmer or they're gonna hibernate. You're going to see things like uh, ermines and moles and squirrels, deer, moose, and elk. The snowshoe hare loves to live here. Um, your bigger things like grizzly bears, wolves, and lynxes and the wolverines are going to live here. And people are like, what do you mean the wolverine? Like the comic book? Well, sort of. There is a small animal called the wolverine that grew up in the taiga. The upper parts of Canada is a taiga. And if you're a super comic book nerd like me, you know that Wolverine originally came from Canada and has Canadian accent in the comic books and the first cartoons when they came out. Um, and that's why he would be um, from that area. And that's, they got that animal from there. And those animals are pretty vicious. They do have huge claws as well. Some animals have camouflage. Their coats are white in the winter. Some of their coats turn like a dark brown in the summertime. And that's an important thing to understand about the taiga because they camouflage is a way for them to live. All right, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to pause this. So for those of us at home that are taking the notes, here are pretty much a copy of the notes that we put on the anchor chart to give us some small facts about the taiga. Taiga. All right, now that we've taken our notes and paused and everything, we're going to move on. You guys need to know, like, if you're watching this on YouTube, it doesn't pause as long as I did. Like, it's literally picking right back up. So make sure you pause and take your notes. We're gonna talk about the tropical rainforest. What are some things that you know before I even, even taught tropical rainforest? What do you know about the rainforest, Annie? A lot of plants, Ava. Rains a lot, Gavin's like, Dad gummit, you took mine. Layla. A lot of water there, right? It says later on that it can rain up to 400 inches. We learned in my class during computers that this room is 10 foot tall. 
12 inches in the foot. So 120 inches is just this room. You would need over three of these rooms stacked on top of each other. That's how much rain they get in a year. That's how many inches of rain they get in a year. Yes. They do have a lot of animals. It is, it is home to half of the Earth's plant and animal species. Half. That is a lot of animals. Now, we said that it is hot there all the time. Who knows why? Again, the rainforest does, it does influence the global weather patterns. Because of all of the heat that's there and the evaporation and transpiration from the trees, that puts a lot of moisture into the air, which is going to then condensate and turn back into a cloud, and then it's going to precipitate and fall back down. Um, so a lot of the things happen from there. They are warm all year long because they are located on that equator. The temperatures don't change between night and day. It's about 70 to 85 degrees and 80%, 88% humidity all the time. That's those days, girls, that you walk outside and before you've even gotten to the car, you're sweating and your hair is frizzy. And you're like, I hate this weather. You would not enjoy living in the rainforest. Again, 80 to 400 inches in the rain in a year, that's ridiculous. Lots of plant life. Now, because there's so many trees, Ariel, there's so many trees that it blocks the sun from getting to the bottom, the floor of the rainforest, and it is very dark down there. Well, we know that plants need sunlight because the ones without sunlight grew and then died that we did our experiment with. Those plants have to find a way to get to the sunlight whether that's to grow in very specific spots where the sun makes it through or to be a vine and wind your way up a tree to the top where you're actually getting some sunlight, which is important, Skylar, for that to happen. These are Some of these are called epiphytes, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Again, half the plants and animals on the earth, 27% of the bird species live in the rainforest or they visit there while they are migrating around the world because it's warm there. Lots of bright colors that we might see. Um, many of the animals, Colton, never leave the trees. They live their entire life in the trees. Never leave. Their food's in the tree, water's up there, that's their habitat, the predators are down below, and they even have to use the bathroom in the trees. So it just right off the side of the branch and at the bottom of the uh, forest floor which for some of these birds, as they're eating seeds, Paisley, like, that's gross. As they eat those seeds out of the fruit, the seeds aren't digested, Evan. Out the backside of the bird to the forest floor, seeds hit the floor, plants start to grow because poop is a good fertilizer. It has a lot of stuff in it that plants can use to grow. It's gross, but it's what's true. They do that to stay away from the predators for a majority of the time. That's important. There's one of the monkeys. It has a tail that helps it kind of hang on to branches and stuff as it lives. If you look in the background, I know a few of my boys will be excited in here if they're going to pay attention at all today at the stick um, insect that's in the background. So you can see him. He looks like a stick, but it's a bug. Lots of ants. Some of the most powerfully stinging animals live there. I'm sure Coyote Peterson has spent his fair time in the rainforest getting stung by all sorts of different things. I will leave this uh, notes up for the people that are at home that are taking notes. Obviously, right down here, the tropical rainforest is in green. It is hot and humid all year round. That's because it's located near the equator. It rains a lot. The forest floor is dark because the tops of the trees, you'll hear them call that the canopy, blocks the sun from getting to the forest floor. There are a lot of tree-dwelling animals that live there, monkeys, birds, sloths. Many animals never leave the trees. I could even add in lots of insects here if I need to, which is fine. Time for those people at home to smash the like button and subscribe.